The impetus behind this presentation was a recent trip to Montgomery County, Arkansas by a baker's dozen members of the Ada Gem Mineral and Fossil Club, including yours truly. It was while we were there that I hit upon the idea of making a short video like this, an overview of the Washita's and their history from a layman's point of view and understanding. The Arkansas portion of the Washita's has long been familiar to me since I grew up not far from there in the Arkansas Valley and had relatives living in Malvern, which meant frequent trips across that range. That field trip to Montgomery County was organized around a Saturday morning visit to a quartz mine near Mount Ida. Here's a Google Earth image of the entire Washita fold belt from an altitude of about 217 miles. If you'll locate Fort Smith right near the top center, the violet colored line that runs almost due south from there is the Arkansas-Oklahoma line. So the Washita's belong to both states approximately equally. This entire view stretches from Little Rock in the east to Lake Holdenville in the west. You might say that the hills around Henrietta are the last gasp of the Washita's in that direction. To the east, they end abruptly at Little Rock. Not too far to the right of center, you can see a bookmark at the house where we stayed, and to the right of that, the shed where I slept. Of course, this calls for some explanation, but first let's zoom in a bit. From an altitude of about 50 miles, Montgomery County fills the screen. Mount Ida is near the center with our Saturday destination lying around seven to eight miles west of town, about halfway to the Polk County line. To the east of Mount Ida is the house where we stayed and the shed where I slept is so close to the house that at this resolution they're impossible to differentiate. It was a lovely experience, by the way. The weather was mild, the night was quiet except for the sweet song of a whippoorwill, and I slept like a log. Keep the mine's location in mind as I scroll away. I'll return to it later. I want to talk about how the Washita's came to be, and I'm going to enlist the help of some graphics from an Oklahoma Geological Survey publication, an overview of the structure and evolution of the Washita orogenic belt from Mississippi to Mexico by Randy Keller and Associates. There's a nice summary of the publication just south of the halfway point of the single paragraph abstract. Our integrated models and geologic constraints show that the Appalachian and Washita orogenic belts were formed during the assembly of Pangaea, completed by around 270 million years ago, and were driven onto the rifted margin by collisions with arcs, exotic terrains, and other continents. They also show that the sinuous curves of the Appalachian Washita origin mimic the shape of the rifted margin and subsequent passive margin shelf edge. This first graphic gives us a summary of the Precambrian state of Proto North America from about 1.7 to 1.1 billion years ago. One of the now smaller continents left after the breakup of the Precambrian supercontinent Rodinia was essentially the core of North America. This is the material that the next great plate closure, the one that assembled Pangaea near the end of the Paleozoic, would work on and shape in new ways. The curved dotted green line near the bottom of the image reflects the edge of the continental margin from well before the Cambrian all the way to the Appalachian and Washita orogenies during the later Paleozoic. Here you see ancient yet familiar features, such as the southern Oklahoma allocogen, responsible for the granite and gabbro of the Wichita Mountains, and the real foot rift, answerable in large part for the Mississippi embayment which shapes the state of Arkansas in a geologically striking way, as you will see shortly. Here you can get an idea of the core of North America, the ancient continent Laurentia, as it pulls away from the rest of Rodinia, a great southern continent that would one day bounce back to heal that rift, but that's hundreds of millions of years in the future at this point. 
But when it did come, that ancient continental margin practically defined the configuration of the Appalachian, Washita, orogeny, as you can see from the dotted orange line. Here's an overview of the entire orogeny extending all the way from the Appalachian systems in the east through the Washita's at mid-continent down through the Marathon Mountains of southwestern Texas and on into Mexico. It's difficult to imagine the scope of it, especially since there's so little left of all of it. The quartzite and schist regions of the Appalachians and Marathons are still standing somewhat proud, as that material will, but the Washita's were mainly composed of shale and sandstone and never experienced the kind of compressive forces that metamorphosed so much of the ancient rock of those related ranges. It seems doubtful to me that the Washita's ever got nearly as high as the Arbuckles are thought to have gotten. The Washita's were pushed up out of deep sea bottom right at the continental margin. The result is a preponderance of shale, which folds more easily than sandstone or the carbonates, yields much more readily to the compressive forces of colliding continents. It's not unusual to spot fully recumbent folds in shale in road cuts throughout the Arkansas portion of the range. And of course, shale, once exposed at the surface, is trying to revert to its original condition, mud. Hard to build an enduring mountain range of such stuff. I want now to examine a cross section plotted fairly near where we collected at that quartz mine recently. Here's the entire Washita range laid out in a different schematic with some of the areas singled out for study. We'll be looking at section AR4, the dark line to the right that runs vertically right through the oldest part of the Washita's, the Benton Uplift. The northern terminus of this cross section is the Arkansas River between Johnson and Logan counties. The section runs south through Yell County, then practically right along the county line between Montgomery and Garland counties, and terminates at the Pike-Clark County line right about where the Triassic sediments of the Gulf Coastal Plain set in. You may notice the Mississippi embayment to the right. Keep that in mind. Here's the section in its entirety. Left is north. Note that there is no vertical exaggeration. In this cross-section, rock that has long since been removed by erosion, a prominent example here being all that's missing from the Benton uplift, can be reconstructed conjecturally based on the clues given in what remains. To both the north and south, you can spot the various shades of blue that designate Pennsylvanian period sediments. Those rocks are actually the cap rock of both the Washita's and Ozarks to the north, the difference being that the Ozarks weren't nearly so tormented by compressive forces during the uplift of that large dome-shaped plateau, with the result that all the faults there are normal faults and a good deal of the more recent cover remains in the Boston Mountains. That's all long since gone from the Washita's, which were both raised much higher, hence more vulnerable to weathering and erosive forces than the lower-lying plateau, and were also much more fractured, riddled with thrust faults and with some strata tilted to vertical and beyond. And once the cap rock was gone, those vulnerable shales started turning back into clay as fast as possible because that's what they were to begin with. But there are some hard sandstones in some of that more ancient Paleozoic rock, the ones rendered in vivid permutations of pink and purple, and it is there that we'll find the quartz we were mining the other day. Keep in mind that this cross-section runs right down the county line between Montgomery and Garland counties, and I'd estimate that the mine we visited lies some 25 miles to the west of that line. I've learned from various Arkansas Geological Commission publications that the oldest rock exposed at the surface in Arkansas is in Montgomery County. Just by glancing at this schematic, you can see that the Washita's are essentially a large anticlinorium, and eroded anticlines of any size always exhibit exactly what we see here. If you start at one edge of the anticline and travel towards its center, the rocks at the surface will get older and older until you reach the center 
and then will get younger and younger on your way back out the other side. All that folding at the center of the anticlinorium has resulted in some impressive distortions like this bedding tipped to vertical at Y City and Polk County and this synclinal fold near Hot Springs. It's time to take a look at a geologic map of Arkansas. Of course, all the features are far too small to be legible at this scale, but what I want to focus on is the fact that the state is neatly bisected on the diagonal by the Mississippi Embayment and Gulf Coastal Plain. To the west and north of that line are the hills, including the Washita's and Ozarks. To the east and south are the floodplains and coastal sediments of the Embayment and Coastal Plain. The divide is so stark because the embayment is an enormous down-dropped block attributable to the real foot rift, which I pointed out in an earlier graphic. All that crumpled seafloor sediment pushed up into ancient mountains was continuous from Maine to Big Bend, but time and gravity and tectonic processes and erosion and deposition have done their work and erased large portions of the orogenic belt from view at the surface. To the lower left of this map lie the Washita's in the deep pinks of the earliest periods of the Paleozoic. The extent of the folding is obvious. The rivers in this region all exhibit trellis patterns in their drainage following the fault lines. The more northerly part of the Washita's still retains its Pennsylvanian cover as you can see from all the blue. That bright blue patch just south of the Arkansas River is Mount Magazine, which is topped by the most recent of the Pennsylvanian sediments deposited in Arkansas. North of the Arkansas River is the highest of the Ozark Plateaus, the Boston Mountains, topped by the Atoka Formation sandstones, which are very resistant to erosion and form wonderful vertical bluffs. Farther to the north lie the older Mississippian rocks of the Springfield Plateau, dominated in Arkansas by the Boone Formation. And to the east of Harrison, the north-central part of the state, one encounters the older Devonian and Ordovician age rocks of the Salem Plateau. And then the Mississippi embayment cuts it all neatly in two with this vast sprawling delta composed of quaternary sediments. But those same ancient rocks found in the Ozarks are continuous on into Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. Now I'll zoom in on the Washita's, and it becomes apparent that one of the reasons the area looks so vivid on the map is that the faults are all indicated in red, meaning they're all compressional faults, reverse or thrust faults. This is what accounts for the tortured state of the rock in the Washita's. In the Ozarks to the north, the rocks have been left untroubled by such forces and mild extensional forces have created only normal faults. I've circled a few items for orientation. To the right is Hot Springs, whose thermal springs are owing entirely to the crust's geothermal gradient and have no relation whatsoever to the Magnet Cove Igneous province a few miles to the east where over a hundred minerals have been found. To the north of Hot Springs, at the top of the map, is the little town of Ola. The winding highway that connects Ola and Hot Springs is Arkansas 7. If one is approaching Ola from the north, one is about to leave the flat stretches of the ancient Arkansas River's floodplain and enter the Washita's. A trip south on Highway 7 takes one to Hot Springs, which is near the core of the range, and then one can proceed south from Hot Springs on the same numbered highway and drive out of the Washita's at Arkadelphia at the bottom of the map. You can see here the general pattern I earlier described, driving through increasingly older sediments as one approaches the hinge line of the anticline and through progressively younger ones out the other side. Of course, to the south, the range is truncated by the downdrop of the embayment and Gulf Coastal Plain. Highway 7 does not cut through the very oldest of the Washita's constituent rocks, however. The highway that does that is Arkansas 27, seen farther to the west, on which one can drive in a southerly direction from Danville at the top of the map, a few miles west of Ola, and experience the oldest rocks in the range near Mount Ida. Mount Ida is about halfway between Hot Springs and the Oklahoma Line, 
and the mine we visited on our Saturday outing is about halfway between Mount Ida and the Polk County line, or maybe seven to eight miles. I've circled the region. Notice the formations marked OC and OCM. The capital O in both cases stands for Ordovician, while the C is for Collier Shale and CM for the Crystal Mountain Sandstone. These are the oldest formations exposed in Arkansas, right at the heart of the Washita's. Here's the entire stratigraphic column for the Arkansas Valley and Washita regions, and you see our two formations there at the very bottom. This stratigraphic summary was published by the Arkansas Geological Commission in connection with the map I just showed you, and here's the foreword to the section of the summary that deals with the Washita Mountains. The Washita Mountains are made up of complexly folded and faulted Paleozoic Age sedimentary rocks that were originally deposited in mostly deep marine environments. The continental collision during the late Paleozoic that pushed up this region produced a structural fabric that trends more or less east-west. The folding was intricate at all scale levels and several local sequences, both complete and partial, are overturned. Compressional faulting is commonly expressed in the sequence throughout the area. That is, all the faults are thrust faults. The Washita province, in a general sense, can be considered an anticlinorium, misspelled, with late Cambrian and early Ordovician age deposits being exposed at the center and Mississippian and Pennsylvanian age sediments exposed around the margins. The area is cut off to the east by the Gulf Coastal Plain and Mississippi Embayment. We've been over all that. So the thing to do now is figure out which formation is likely to match the description of the mine we were plundering on our field trip. Here's the description of the Collier Shale, the oldest of the formations exposed there. The age of the formation is late Cambrian period and early Ordovician. The sequence is composed of gray to black lustrous shale containing occasional thin beds of dense black and intensely fractured chert and with an interval of bluish gray, dense to sparry, thin bedded limestone. The limestone is conglomeratic and pelatoidal, in part near the top, with pebbles and cobbles of limestone, chert, metaarcos, and quartz. The entire unit displays intensive deformation and frequent small quartz veins. Fossils are rare, but include trilobites and conodonts. The base of the formation is not exposed, but the total thickness of the exposed portion exceeds 1,000 feet. Well, that doesn't sound at all like where we were digging. Next in the sequence is the Crystal Mountain Sandstone. This formation is early Ordovician period age. The formation is typically composed of massive, coarse-grained, well-rounded, light gray sandstone. Lesser amounts of interbedded light gray to gray shale, black chert, bluish gray limestone, and gray calcareous conglomeratic sandstone, often containing clasts of metaarcos, are usually present. Some large boulders of metaarcos and other exotics occur in some slurried conglomerate intervals. The unit is often set with a network of quartz veins up to several inches thick. In some places, the quartz veins are open up to several feet wide, allowing clusters of quartz crystals to form. Conodont fossils are known from this unit. The contact with the underlying collier shale is considered conformable. Typical thicknesses of the unit range from 500 to 850 feet, but some sites may have less than 50 feet. That sounds exactly like where we were digging. What do you think? By the way, those beds dip north at about 23 degrees, to the best of my ability to calculate. <laughs> 